every saver will get back every penny guaranteed by the government. Why has it taken until now to make the offer? Will it work to stop the panic? And who will be blamed? I think the Chancellor is right. There's 99% chance that he's right. The 1% chance can be that he's not right. Should the Bank of England's governor have acted more like his American counterpart and injected the markets with cash? And in the last of our interrogations of party leaders, Ming Campbell is in the hot seat. Good evening. Rather like the political version of Corporal Jones and Dad's army, ministers have discovered that merely yelling don't panic to save us at Northern Rock just doesn't work. So tonight the government has done something quite extraordinary, in effect offering a blank cheque to recompense every saver for every penny. Whether this will work, we'll know tomorrow from the queues on the high street. But is the government's own reputation for economic competence now on the line? Here's Paul Mason with the day's remarkable events. He's not been Chancellor Long, but today, Alistair Darling got a chance to make history. I can announce today that following discussions with the Governor of the Bank of England and the Chairman of the FSA, should it be necessary, we and the Bank of England would put in place arrangements that would guarantee all the existing deposits in the Northern Rock Bank during the current instability in the financial markets. Hold on, didn't he say that before? Well, no he didn't. It was the third working day of the crisis, and at this London branch of Northern Rock, a queue of up to 400 savers, and all of two people on the counter. The prospects for Northern Rock's survival are changing fast. On Friday, it could claim it had a problem of liquidity, that's ready cash. Now it has a problem of credibility. It's losing deposits at the rate of a billion pounds a day, and it would be losing them faster if it let people in faster. So today, the frustration was vented on the government. The public, and I'm part of the public, just don't believe being non-party political any longer. And I'm sure it's because of 10 years under Blair. Do not believe what a politician says. I am quite sure in the 50s and the 60s, if a Chancellor stood up and said, your money is safe, that would be the end of the conversation. But here in 2007, nobody believes the Chancellor. Why not? Because Mr Blair's told too many lies. You ask me why I don't trust the, uh, trust the government or the Treasury. I, because if I did trust them, I would, it would have meant from my experience that when it came to the war, Mr, the Chancellor's Exchequer, Mr. Mr Brown, would have opposed going to the war. Who would have any confidence in what the government says? Why does it keep coming back to the government? Because they're the people who run everything here in the country. And they've said it's safe. Um, they've said a lot of things over the last 10 years and they've been proved to be liars quite a few times. I'm a pensioner like so many here are pensioners. They don't want to lose any money. But the Chancellor's saying you won't lose any money. Well, you know about equity life? Equitable life? Yeah. What happened afterwards? We haven't had a run on a UK bank for decades and in the interim something's changed. You could put it down to the general decline of deference, but on this queue, I'm hearing something more specific. Worries about the financial competence of the government, and that's something neither Alistair Darling nor Gordon Brown want to hear. Chancellor, I've spent the afternoon with people on the queue outside a Northern Rock branch, and unfortunately they don't believe you when you say their money is safe. Now, that might be irrational, but it is real. Is there nothing more you can do than what you've already done and what you've said today to reassure them that that money is there? I do recognise that people are concerned and that's why, to put the matter beyond all doubt, I've made it clear that we will take the necessary action to ensure that people's uh, uh, deposits within the, the, the uh, uh, Northern Rock Bank are uh, safe and they are guaranteed. Now, that is unequivocal I want to put the matter beyond all doubt because I think people are entitled to that degree of certainty. So they can take the money out if that's what they want to do, but if they leave it there, then we are saying to them that that money will be guaranteed they won't lose it. Tonight's deal goes beyond what was agreed on Thursday. There is no £32,000 limit on compensation. The deposits are underwritten by the taxpayer 
The deal is open to any bank meeting the lender of last resort requirement, but it's not a new law. It is, as the Chancellor's people put it, my word is my bond. What Alistair Darling's done is unprecedented. It's not the Bank of England now that stands behind Northern Rock Sabres, but the government, and for unlimited sums. They couldn't tell us when they made the announcement whether that money will show up on the Treasury's books, but it surely must. What they did say was this, that the measures taken last Thursday have not had the confidence effect they might have done. If it all seems slightly improvised, it is, but there's a risk of contagion. Over the last 10 years, mortgage lending has grown from 400 billion to well over 1 trillion pounds. This is what the banks lent. This is what the building societies lent. But the real growth has been in so-called specialist lenders, people who only do mortgages and mainly do them like Northern Rock. And there's 321 billion worth of this kind of debt in the economy. Well, increasingly clients are saying to me that we face a global recession in 2008 as a result of what's happened in the US and now what we're seeing in the UK. Uh, ultimately the only response to that is to cut interest rates but the danger here is that the authorities seem to be asleep at the wheel uh, and that by the time they do start cutting interest rates they will have limited impact as we saw indeed in Japan during the 1990s. That's the kind of fear that drove Alliance and Leicester's shares down 31% today and Bradford and Bingley's by 15%. Still, the deposits of these people are safe. Alistair Darling just effectively nationalised them. Paul Mason, well, I'm joined now from the Liberal Democrat Conference in Brighton by our political editor, Michael Crick. Michael, um, is it your sense that the government's entire economic credibility is actually on the line tonight? Well, I think you, uh, you saw that with the, the savers that uh, Paul Mason was talking to uh, today. I mean, this is the biggest crisis that the Treasury has faced uh, since the, the fuel protests of uh, the year 2000, uh, seven years ago. And the fact that the government had to come back tonight with a stronger uh, raft of measures shows that they sense the huge political dangers that there are here. And I think that the opposition parties, the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats here in Brighton do sense potential blood. Uh, George Osborne and David Cameron for the Conservatives over the last few days have been pointing out the underlying problem uh, raised by Paul Mason in his report of the ex huge explosion in personal debt that we've seen under the, uh, the economic stewardship of Gordon Brown over the last 10 years, a point again made by the uh, Liberal Democrat Treasury spokesman Vince Cable here in Brighton. He says he's been banging on about this for the last uh, four or five years. David Cameron today was saying that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Alistair Darling has got to come out with a much more comprehensive explanation of the background to this whole affair. Uh, Vince Cable was saying tonight that the government's got to make it clear that this guarantee doesn't just apply to Northern Rock depositors, but to depositors with all banks. Uh, very briefly, Michael, if I may, uh, what do you think then the political fallout is likely to be? Well, I think it's pretty unlikely. There's a certain sense of relief here in Brighton tonight that we're not going to see a general election uh, this autumn. And, of course, the Liberal Democrats, they're in the doldrums, and, and they'd probably be glad of that. But it also makes it more difficult in the longer term. If this has a, a knock-on effect on house prices and on the economy, that makes it much more difficult to Gordon Brown to contemplate an election even next spring or maybe even uh, next year. It, it does severely constrain him politically. Michael, thanks very much. Well, we asked the Chancellor of the Exchequer or one of his Treasury team to join us tonight, but we were told they were unavailable. I'm joined now by Philip Hammond, who is the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. I mean, presumably you think, Gord, that the government has now done the right thing. Uh, given where we've got to today, the steps that the government has taken today were necessary to try to restore confidence. There's an awful lot of people out there very worried about their life savings, and the key thing now is to contain this crisis to restore confidence and calm to the markets and once that has been done then we will need to get some answers to the hard questions about what has happened in the run-up to this crisis the way that the regulatory system has worked. Where, where do you think this leaves the banking system because it's not entirely clear what this would mean if another bank were to get into trouble later this week. Well, the banking system is built on confidence and clearly the move that Alistair Darling has made this evening is intended to restore that confidence and underpin that confidence and hopefully uh, that will do the trick and reassure um, depositors. But I think that the longer term questions, both about the fundamentals of the economy, the, the, the huge surge in personal debt, which 
does make Britain's economy, as Alan Greenspan has said this morning, much more vulnerable to these kind of shocks than many of our competitors. Um, and, and, and also about the new tripartite regulatory system that was introduced by Gordon Brown in 1997 as part of his Bank of England reforms, whether that has really worked, because but, 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 uh, sorry, it, it's supposed to stop this kind right. of crisis. But, but are, you, are you not slightly queasy about talking about this decade of debt and so on? I mean, many people in Britain have benefited from this. Businesses have been able to borrow cheap, cheaply. Yep. People's houses have gone up in price. They feel better off. I mean, you can't criticise them for, for well, that, can you? Well, that is true, but I think we all know in our heart of hearts that uh, building the economy on debt uh, leaves us fundamentally vulnerable. We all know that from our own personal finances. There's prudent borrowing and then there's more than prudent borrowing. Uh, and if we are, the most important thing is stability. People want to know that their mortgage rates over the long term will be stable, that their jobs will be safe. Uh, and a short term kick through a, a dramatic increase in credit uh, if it leads to long term instability has not delivered for the economy. Let, let me just ask you a straight question about uh, Northern Rock. People should put their money into Northern Rock, shouldn't they? I mean, they're getting great rates of interest and it's backed up by the government. Can't lose. Well, we're, we're waiting to see some more details of the guarantee, but the way it looks on the face of it, um, we now have the Northern Rock offering, as I understand it, 6.9% uh, to depositors with a government guarantee behind it. That does look pretty attractive. Why would you buy government bonds? Well, that's a very good question. Okay, well, perhaps we can find a good answer, Mr. Hammond. Thanks very much. So what we have tonight is the first run on a bank in, British bank in decades and what looks like a profound loss of confidence from some savers, deeply unimpressed by the assurances that have been given. But could the Bank of England have acted differently? Tomorrow, the US Federal Reserve is expected to cut interest rates. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Lord Lamont, the former Chancellor, and Will Hutton. First, our economics editor, Stephanie Flanders, reports on the varying responses to the wider financial crisis here and in the United States. Britain and America were joined at the hip today calling for confidence to return, but behind the scenes there's been a big gap between the Federal Reserve's approach to this crisis and the Bank of England's. The Chancellor and Secretary Paulson are in the media front line, but it's the central bank governors that are in the trenches in the markets. Now, in normal times, all the central bank governors tend to do a lot of talk about what's called moral hazard. That's the idea that if you bail investors out for their mistakes, then they'll go and take too many risks. That's in normal times. In abnormal times, like the last few weeks, only Mervyn King has been willing to hang tough. Take a look at what's happened to date. In early August, the failure of a big American mortgage provider rocked the US markets, but it was the news three days later that a major French bank was affected that really spooked investors. Markets plunged. In the next two days, the ECB injected £140 billion worth into the markets, and the Fed offered as much as is needed. The Bank of England did not. The next week, as conditions deteriorated, the Fed cut one of its official rates to try to help out banks. Short-term rates spiked in the city, but the bank declined to act. A few days later, the Fed chairman met publicly with American legislators and said he'd use all the tools at his disposal to restore confidence. On September 6th, the ECB met and injected another $28 billion into the market. The Bank of England also met and put its interest rates on hold. Finally, last week, Mervyn King issued a statement. But in it, he ruled out the provision of easy cash for banks on the grounds that it sowed the seeds of future crises. The day after he made that statement, the Bank of England offered an unlimited credit line to Northern Rock. But they wouldn't see that as a U-turn at all. For starters, Northern Rock's paying an interest rate of about 7%, a penal rate, on that loan. And the authorities have made clear that it's depositors they're worried about, not Northern Rock. If savers are protected, but shareholders lose their shirts, well, the Bank of England would say they're still not protecting investors from their mistakes. Not everyone would agree, but if the bank hasn't changed its position, there are plenty in the markets who say it should. Privately, banks and some US and ECB officials are amazed he stood firm so long, though Secretary Paulson didn't decide to propagate that view more broadly today. and in your prime minister who, who knows his stuff cold. Trust me, he's been uh, around for a long time. So. One of Paulson's predecessors does think the balance of risks favours action. Moral hazard and confidence are opposite sides of the same coin. 
And it is important also at a moment when people are selling, people are not lending in anticipation of the fact that others will liquidate their positions to be cognizant of restoring uh, confidence. And so I think that does have to be one of the priorities uh, in the situation. Though the irony is not lost on everyone that in this case it's Americans who want to intervene in the market and Brits who are laissez-faire. Yeah, unfettered capitalism works great on the way up. We don't need regulation. The markets are uh, the ultimate arbiter. Free markets for free men. But when the markets work on the way down, the system must be saved and taxpayer dollars must be used to, uh, to shore up all the failings of supposedly smart people. I, I find it just incredibly distasteful. <laughs> Despite the Fed's support, very short-term rates in the U.S. have risen almost as much as they have here. King would say that shows he's right not to write banks a load of blank checks. But if credit conditions stay tight, that will hurt firms and borrowers who haven't done anything wrong. It is not usually thought of as an objection to the existence of fire departments that perhaps some people will smoke uh, in bed. And that is all the more true when there's the prospect that a fire in one house will spread to other houses where nobody has done anything uh, dangerous. Everyone expects the Fed to cut its main interest rate tomorrow, but that's now deemed less a bailout for investors than an effort to limit the fallout for the economy. If things continue as they have, the Bank of England may well have to take the same view. I think the risks of contagion, and thereby really a systemic crisis, are certainly there. And at the root of it, inevitably, will be uh, the blame for Mervyn King and Gordon Brown. King would say it makes for a safer system if you're tough on institutions that overreach. There are banks who passed up the risky schemes who'll wonder why they bothered if the others don't pay a price. It definitely would have been better if investors had been more careful during the boom. But now is a risky time to try to teach all of them a lesson. Well, Stephanie is with me now, as are Will Hutton of the Work Foundation and Lord Lamont, Lamont, Norman Lamont, who as Chancellor had his own upsets with the markets in the early 1990s. I just wondered what, what you thought of today's events. I mean, do you see this as a watershed in some way? Uh, I was surprised that Alistair Darling uh, said what he did, but on reflection, I think it was probably the right thing to do. I think the risk of contagion is there. The bank are still, and the government are still, making a distinction between depositors and shareholders. And in the end, Northern Rock will be sold. Uh, the depositors will be saved, but the management and the shareholders will pay the price. So there's still and a moral hazard there. Uh, that is, I, I think many people are critical of the Bank of England. I am not critical of the Bank of England. I think the situation in America is different. The economy is at a different stage. I think the ECB's action has not really had uh, great effect. And I think it is right to guard against moral hazard. I fully support what Mervyn King has done. And uh, although there is this risk of contagion, hopefully what the Chancellor said today will stop that. Well, uh, I could put it another way. Is this the worst day since 1997 since Labour came in in terms of economic competence, how their credibility is being seen? Didn't look good. It really didn't look good. They weren't in control of events. I mean, I expected a statement this morning. I thought between 7 and 8 o'clock this morning the, uh, the Treasury and the bank would uh, put out a statement saying more or less uh, what was said this evening. And actually doing it in the way they did it had an eerie, eerie uh, reminder of Norman Lamont, uh, uh, <laughs> Black Wednesday. There they, well, you know, the starts are going to be no bailouts. And the, finally, the markets actually forced them into, a, into what looked like a policy reversal. And in fact, we've got to the right place, but we've not got there um, in good order. We were in the middle of a bank run. Uh, it started in the interbank markets in the city. It's been there for six weeks. It spilled over into retail banking. There should certainly have been some preemptive preparation, instead of which the governor took this stance that there were going to be no bailouts, as uh, Stephanie said. It's, in effect, feels like it's been reversed, even though you can just about... Well, just there's a distinction about, between yeah, the, the, just the about, shareholders and... The, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, name me, name me a bailout in the last hundred years in which shareholders and anything else than actually taken the rap. No one who's argued for, for bailouts has ever argued that the shareholders should walk away with a smile on their Not face. Enough. Well, far be it for me to defend the government, but I think there are two distinctions that have to be made. One is between depositors and shareholders, as has been made clear, and the other is between 
saving the depositors in a particular bank or flooding the system with liquidity. One of the things that we have learned from uh, the 1987 yeah. stock market crash or from the savings and loans uh, problems in America is that if you overreact to this by cutting interest rates generally for everybody, you often get the consequences several years later. And in fact, the, the only point of connection between the ERM, which you mentioned, and this, the only point of connection is that actually a lot of the problems that were caused in the early 90s dated from the overreaction to the 1987 stock exchange crash where, and I think Nigel Lawson would agree with this, I think with hindsight he felt he had probably cut rates too much and the result was we subsequently had inflation. Is this going to work? I mean, when we wake up tomorrow morning, if there's still queues outside, long queues outside the Northern Rock, it's not worked, has it? It better had worked. I mean, I, I think that it's the best thing the government can do. They've effectively said, uh, not just this bank, but other banks in trouble, you're safe. Um, there are issues. I mean, we for everybody watching this program, all taxpayers are now backing Britain's bankers and their deposits that are made in them. I mean, it's a big point, and I, you know, we, it's, it's our savings and the, and the guarantee that sits behind the one that we make, which allows them and to make the bets that they make, and I think that there's going to have to be some redrafting of the balance of um, regulation in our country. Let me bring in Stephanie on that, just uh, to be clear on this. Is this an offer of some kind of blank cheque to the bankers of Britain? A uh, blank cheque that everybody watching is guaranteeing? It depends what you think is a blank cheque. I mean, it's, it is an implicit guarantee to any bank that's willing to go through what Northern Rock went through to get its emergency well, facility last week, which I can't imagine a lot of banks are really going to queue up for. You have to qualify for emergency support. You then have possibly the sort of pariah status that Northern Rock got. But look, I mean, this was a, this was a response to something that the, over the weekend, basically, the authorities realised there, there was a real problem with the way that Britain deals with bankrupt banks. The way we deal with them actually tends to encourage problems that are a problematic bank into going bank because if any depositor this weekend looking at Northern Rock knows that if, if even in a small chance that it went bankrupt their deposits would be frozen. It could be months before they get them back and even then they might not get them all back. It's in the contrast with the US by the way where actually a regulator would, would take over uh, a, trouble, a bank that's gone bankrupt and all depositors would be paid off within 24 hours. Right, well, could, I mean, the FDIC so we could learn from that couldn't well, we? I just want to say I mean I uh, this is probably this is the case but actually the idea that you should discover it this weekend sure. after a crisis that's been going on for six weeks is, I find, simply gobsmacking. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing line that you've been given. And, I, well, and I'm not, sure you challenged it. It's the truth that it's a yeah, hole it's in the system. Whether it should have been waking realized up on, before waking up on Sunday an afternoon and saying, oh my God, no, uh, this, this, crisis, this crisis has been it going on for six weeks. The dynamic. I mean, to be fair, we, I don't, I'm not in the position of defending them either. <laughs> the Bank but, of England yeah, are welcome there to come in and been, defend As we would all agree, there haven't been a lot of bank runs for people to look at recently. In the process of this bank run, it was realized that there was no natural end point because any depositor thinking there was a small chance of that end position of having their deposits frozen for months and months thought it made sense to good get point, the money but out. Good point, but, but my counterpoint is when you say it was realised. <laughs> this has been going on since the right. second week of August. I uh, just want to bring in a lot well, of... There has been a bank run since okay. the first week of August. There's been a bank run since then. <laughs> but that's, what, that's how he described it in his letter to the, to the Treasury Lord, last week. Lord Lamont, I mean, you were talking about knock-on consequences of the cure in, in, in the past actually causing further problems uh, down the line. I mean, how far are we all going to be paying for this in the future? Well, it depends on the eventual cost, and obviously the consequences of this may spread uh, to other parts of the economy. I think, as Alan Greenspan said, he's not the first person to say it, the British economy is more exposed to danger and risk in this situation. Our financial services sector is much larger. There is obviously an overheated housing market, which is coming off the boil now. There are huge risks in this, and we may face consequences that go on for a long time. I think in the United States, there are further ahead in these events than we are. Thank you all very much. And let's have a look at the markets. Those bank shares were downgraded. The FTSE 100 share index finished down more than 100 points. In New York, the Dow Jones also closed down. Against the euro, the pound was down. Against the dollar, the pound was down. Well, it's been the first full day of the Liberal Democrat conference in Brighton. They've set out a radical package of measures to tackle climate change, including a policy designed to make Britain carbon neutral by 2050. But in the wings of the conference, there have been mutterings about Simingus Campbell's leadership. Before going to Brighton, Simingus joined me to be cross-examined by our economics editor Stephanie Flanders and political correspondent David Grossman in the final of our series of interviews with the three party leaders.
Simingas Campbell, welcome to the program. Thank you. The fundamental question facing your party in the 21st century is why do you exist at all? What's the point of the Lib Dems now? There never was a time when liberal democrat values were more needed than they are now. And the old traditional split in British politics between left and right, in my view, is no longer relevant. It's the difference between liberal and authoritarian. And we're the real liberals. Rather interestingly, you don't hear Mr. Cameron calling himself.